There's always a better way There's always a place in me that's crossing There's always the straight and the narrow The wide and the shallow But I know that you're guiding me And the best is yet to come You're giving me hope for tomorrow And I know someday Then I'll wake up to find your glory divine And I'll finally bow at your feet Oh, I'll lift up your name in heart and praise When I cross over Jordan I know that I'll be ready for you It's always the simple things It's always the obvious The crashes over me It's always in front of me It helps me to remember That this is what I live for And I can't wait Till I wake up to fly Step down from glory 
to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation. Jesus, we thank you for this night. God, we thank you that you want to speak to us. We thank you that you want to use us, that you want to do a work in our life and through our life. And I ask that we wouldn't just be so focused on what we're seeing in front of us, but instead we'd focus on your big picture that you have laid in front of us, the path that you want us to take, the plans that you have for us, and the things that you'd like us to accomplish. And I thank you that you have them for us, that we're not just here for no reason, but we're here to serve you and to do what you have us to do. And it's all for our good and your good. And I just thank you that that's who you are. And I ask that you would use us, help us to be able to focus tonight and um, just let you do the work that you want to do. Have your way in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Whitney. And welcome to Grace Fellowship Online. 
take your friend to friend card out and let's pray for our friends and pray for ourselves as we open up God's word together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our friends. We thank you for our acquaintances, the people that we come across in life that you've placed on our hearts to pray for. We lift them up to you right now and we ask that by whatever means necessary, you'd bring them into your kingdom so that we could all spend eternity together. Lord, if you'd like to use us, we're more than available. So just let us know what to do. We thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for your word. I ask that as we open it up this morning, or this afternoon, uh, or this evening, whatever this is, that you would open up our hearts and help us to hear from your Holy Spirit. You have a message for your church tonight. So speak to us. Help us to not just be hearers of your word, but help us to leave this place doers of your word. And we thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 2. And we'll start at the 16th verse, since we left off at the 15th verse last time. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. They came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Then some shepherds arrived and drove them away. But Moses came to their rescue and watered their flock. When they returned to their father, Reuel, he asked, Why have you come back so quickly today? They answered, An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. So where is he? Asked, he asked his daughters. Why then did you leave the man behind? Invite him to dinner. This was a common custom back then. You didn't just leave strangers in the city square or whatever. You invited people home with you, especially if they did something nice like that for you. Moses agreed to stay with the man, and he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. She gave birth to a son whom he named Gershom, for, she, for he said, I have been a resident alien in a foreign land. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned because of their difficult labor and cried out, and their cry for help because of the difficult labor ascended to God. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God saw the Israelites, and God knew. And we'll stop there. So, Moses really has a, an interesting life. He grows up in the, in the palace of Pharaoh. I heard someone just the other day say that he was probably being groomed to be the next pharaoh. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Um, but he gets a, a, a great education, an aristocratic education, if you will, in Pharaoh's palace. And then he runs out to the desert because Pharaoh's trying to kill him. We all know that. And Moses actually gets the education that he never got growing up in Pharaoh's house. What education was that? Well, he becomes a shepherd. And he'll be herding sheep pretty much for the rest of his life. He marries into the family of a priest, and Moses was already a Levite. So he marries into the priest of Midian's family. And all of this time, it's, yeah, I'm going to focus on something that's only mentioned at the end. But all of this time, the Israelites were praying. And God was listening. God heard their prayers. It says in Exodus 2.23, After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned because of their difficult 
labor and they cried out and their cry for help because of the difficult labor ascended to God. And God heard their groaning. The first part of the 24th verse says. So God heard their groaning. These people were praying. And oftentimes we just like to complicate prayer. But we need to be people of prayer. We're in a war. You might say, yeah, I know we're in a war. We're in a war in Afghanistan. Um, that's not the war I'm talking about. We're in a spiritual war. And in our war, just like in physical wars, communication with headquarters is essential. You lose contact with those in command, and you'll lose the war. And we knew that in the first Gulf War. We started pounding and pounding and pounding their communications. So when we advanced into Iraq, they had lost their communications. When our troops went in, they found the enemy troops in disarray and ready to surrender. They didn't know what to do. I don't know if you remember, if you're old enough, you remember, you know, the, the videos of people just holding up white flags because they had no idea what they needed to do. Why? They couldn't communicate with their leaders. I often talk in marriage counseling about communication. I actually talk about it a lot. Because most of the problems that happen in a marriage happen because people have forgotten how to communicate with their partner. So if communication in your marriage breaks down, you're likely to lose the marriage. Oh, you might stay together, but you don't really have a marriage very much anymore. Because we need to be communicating constantly. We need to be clear on what the other person is saying so that we're not in conflict all the time. The devil knows all of these things and he would like to stop us from communicating with headquarters. Why? Because God hears when we pray. God hears when we pray. There's, there's a book called This Present Darkness, which is a novel. It's, it's not, um, it's not a, a, a true story. It's a novel. It's fantasy. But it, it's talking about, and basically it, it's pretty much scripturally on target. It's talking about what happens when we pray. This Present Darkness, its sequel is Piercing the Darkness. Don't pick them up unless you have time to actually read the whole thing because you're going to get engrossed in these books. I did, and I'm not much of a reader. I, I'd prefer to see the movie. <laughs> but Paul tells us, because of these things, Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, he says, pray continually. We should have an ongoing dialogue with God. We should be praying all the time. No, you don't have to pray out loud. You don't have to get on your knees. You don't have to do any of that stuff. But we need to be praying continually. See, we don't just have... My, my wife and I pray every day at the breakfast table. Now, is that the only time we pray? No. Evelyn has an ongoing conversation with God. I have an ongoing conversation with God. Sometimes I set aside time where, where things are turned off and I can just talk to God for a few minutes by myself, read the word for a few minutes by myself. But you know, we have to have that constant dialogue with God. We've, we've religified everything that we do in the name of Jesus. Our prayer life doesn't have to be like that. That's why Paul says, it's simple, pray continually. Always have a conversation with God. You know what happens when you do that? You're, you're constantly aware that God is in the room with you. So if I'm aware that God's in the room with me, am I likely to do what God wants me to do? Or am I likely to do what the devil wants me to do? God wants you to do. Yeah, what God wants me to do. 
Very good, Evelyn. <laughs> Thank you. Philippians 4, 6. We're all familiar with this. It says, don't worry about anything. So what are we supposed to worry about? Anything or nothing? Nothing. So we don't worry about anything. That means we worry about nothing. But in everything, so we don't worry about anything, but the everything that we do through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. In everything that we do through prayer, and petition, see, prayer is conversation with God. Petition is asking him for something. So, you know, right off the bat, you get the idea. Prayer is not just a list of demands to God. It's not just a, a honeydew list for God. With thanksgiving, we need to be thankful. We, we're thankful for what? Thankful for what we have. I need to be thankful for what I have and then praying to the God who gave me those things. Being thankful, it says, present your requests to God. And after that, it says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. See, we need to have that conversation going so that we can have prayers and petitions and be thankful to God <coughs> for the things that he's done. And we're able to present our requests to God. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that I'm, I'm putting the things that are going on in my life, I'm putting them in God's hands. And that's why I can have peace because now God's in control. Am I making sense? Matthew 26, 41, Jesus is speaking and he says, stay awake and pray so that you won't enter in the temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. See, the devil knows that when we're in prayer, we're probably not in a place in our life where we're going to be tempted by something. Why? I'm having a conversation with God. <coughs> Now, the truth is, excuse the coughing. <coughs> now, the truth is, God is always in the room with me. God is always everywhere I go. But somehow, when you're talking to God, you're more aware that he's there. See, when we're not talking to God, sometimes it's like, Oh, God's not here. I'm going to do some bad thing that I wouldn't do if God was here. But you know what? God's there. So prayer just keeps me mindful that God's in the room. And maybe I'll clean up my act while I'm mindful that God's in the room. The devil knows that. And, and he tries to defeat us. And what does he do to try to defeat us? He tries to destroy our prayer life. Why? That's communications with headquarters. He, he does that a lot of times by what we talked about Wednesday, guilt and condemnation. We don't need to go over those uh, again. But see, we don't feel good enough sometimes to, because we're looking behind like we talked about, right? I mean, like we talked about Sunday. Sorry, I'm getting mixed up on what day it is. Um, but we're sitting back, we're not praying because we don't feel good enough to pray, right? If you didn't hear Sunday's teaching, go back and listen to that because it, it, it's on point to what we're talking about right now. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, you haven't done something that's too big for God to forgive. If you've, if you've repented, turned away from your sin and confessed it to God, then he's forgiven you and you can move on and stop looking backwards like we talked about on Sunday. See, when Satan reminds you of your past, you point him to where you were baptized. Say that guy or that gal was buried in Lake Levon or in Chris and Deanna's pool 
or in somebody else's pool, or in somebody else's lake. Wherever you, or in the baptismal of whatever church you got baptized in. Wherever it is, because that's where your old man is. You left your old man, not your husband, not your, you know, not your dad, but your old person, the old you. You left the old you behind in that watery grave. Send the devil there. He can find that person there. But you're not that person anymore. So, if we're going to pray, we need to know a couple of things about prayer. We're going to talk about them today. We're going to talk about what prayer is not. Because there's a lot of people that have the wrong idea about prayer. And then we're going to talk about what prayer is. Okay? It's not real complicated, actually. But prayer is not our list of demands. God, do this now! Oh, yes, Don. Yes, Don. I'll hurry right to it. No. See, we try to make God our heavenly waiter instead of our heavenly father. And if he's a good waiter, we'll actually give him a tip on Sunday. James 4.3 says this, You ask and don't receive. Because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. See, prayer is not just asking God, Lord, let me win the lottery. Lord, do this. Lord, do that. You know, for my pleasures. No, we weren't created for our pleasures. Scripture says, and for thy pleasures, and for your pleasures, we were created. That's what they're singing in heaven right now. And for your pleasure, we were created. We're, pre we're created for God's pleasure. We need to be praying things according to his will. Maybe we need to be praying for others instead of just always praying about ourselves. Think about your prayer life. Are you just constantly me, 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 me in your prayer life? Maybe we need to adjust that. God wants us to be others centered how many of our prayers are for others and how many of our prayers are for us i mean don't get me wrong it's not wrong to pray for yourself but if that's all you're praying about that's selfish and that's what james is talking about that's why our prayers aren't answered because it's always about us philippians 4 6 says to present our requests to god not our demands. See, there's a difference. When you present a request to someone, if I say, Evelyn, may I have lobster for dinner? Evelyn will probably say, Not tonight. <laughs> she'll probably say, No, that'll take the whole food budget for the month. No, we're not having lobster for dinner what are you crazy see but if you but a request is like that a request is may i have and evelyn has the ability to say yes or no you're having a salad you're on a diet fatso <laughs> oh she wouldn't say fatso i would she's too polite but see, what we, what we need to do with God is we need to, if we're having a problem, we share the problem with him. And then we let him give the answer. See, the answer to my problem is probably not, God, would you drop fire and brimstone on my boss? That's probably not going to happen. A demand isn't, will you? A demand is, God, do this. Ever, ever have somebody demand something from you? Them to just get on your very last nerve. And you want to say, demand this. You know. Right? We don't do that to God. We present requests to God. We tell God our problems. And then he gives us a solution. See, we think we're on jeopardy. You say, well, how's the jeopardy? Well, we give God the answer. And he tells us the problem. 
I don't need to give God the answer. I need to get the answer from God. I need to get the answer from God. But haven't you gone to God so many times and you already have the answer that you want? Don't you hate it when you talk to people like that? They, they ask you for something and you tell, you tell them whatever it is that you would normally respond and they start on and on and on about whatever they think the answer should be because they already know what they want you to do, but you're just not giving them the right answer. Isn't that like super irritating? Yeah, it is. So if you're one of those people who does that, stop it. <laughs> it's really irritating. Don't do that to God either. God has the ability to give you his answer, not your answer. A lot of times we look at situations, we think we have it figured out, and then God goes a different way. We think God's abandoned us, but he hasn't. How many times have you prayed, God did something way different than what you asked for, but at the, in the end, you found out that was a better answer than what you had. Anybody? Yeah, Evelyn's raising her hand. Sophie's raising her hand. In case you don't know, Sophie's my dog. She's asleep down there. She's not raising her hand. But so, so prayer is not giving God our list of demands. Because if that were what it was, then we would be God. And he would not be. He would be our servant. The one who demands is the one who's in charge, right? I'm not in charge. I don't want to be in charge. <laughs> I want God, the reason I came to Jesus is I want God to take over. And, and most of the time, I've learned to do that. The times that I try to take things into my own hands, I mess them up every single time. And you probably do too. So we know what prayer isn't. So what is prayer? Well, prayer is a dialogue with God. See, most of the time, our prayers are a monologue. It's just us talking. Well, which one of us, between the two, between me and God, which one of us is smarter? Which one of us knows the end from the beginning? Which one knows what's going to happen tomorrow? Well, that would be God. That's not me. That would be God. So I need to have a conversation with God. You know, some people, when you tell them that you've heard God's voice, like Mike Pence did one time, you know, the press just gave him such a hard time that he might be a loony. Well, well, we're not crazy saying that we hear God's voice. I hear God's voice. I have a relationship with God. I know how to talk to God. I know how to listen to God. And I think you probably do too. If you don't, you need to start practicing listening. But we're in a relationship with a gracious and benevolent father. Or daddy. Or pops. It is vital communication with the person in charge. And the devil would like us to listen to all those voices out there trying to shut us down by saying we're crazy, saying that we can hear God's voice. John 15, verses 5 through 8, says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. Because you can do nothing without me. I can do nothing without headquarters. I can't win this war without headquarters. If anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they're burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, that speaks of hearing from him. Ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. So if I'm, if I'm doing things according to that word of his that remains in me, I can ask whatever I want. Why? Because I'm in agreement with him. I'm remaining, I'm in him and he's in me. Am I making sense? 
My father is glorified by this, that you produced much fruit and proved to be my disciples. See, we need to remain in him. The devil would like us to be separated from him. The devil would like us to think that we have no ability to hear from God. It's only crazy people that say they hear from God. No, it's not. We're God's children. Do you communicate with your children? If you don't, it may be one of the reasons that maybe they're not behaving like they should. God communicates with his children. And it's not just through the Bible. And it's not just through people like me teaching his word. God has a relationship with you. And he wants you and he wants me to act like it. Galatians 4, 6, And because you are sons or children... God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. See, the word Abba is the Aramaic casual for for daddy, for father. In, In America, our casual is daddy, pops, papa, dad, and probably some that I'm that I'm forgetting. But we all have a casual. You know, we don't go in to talk to our father and say, oh, mighty earthly father, you are so great and so grand. Please, please hear my request. Now, if Whitney did that to me, I'd be, I'd be sending her to tarot. You know, she, she'd be having a, a major problem. There's a, break, there's a breakdown going on there. But no, we call our we call our fathers dad, daddy, pops, papa, whatever you call your dad. James 5 1, excuse me, James 5 16, the second half says the prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. See, God loves you, He has a relationship with you, and when you talk to God, it's powerful. It's powerful. When you read the book, This Present Darkness, you can see when the Christians pray, the heavens are moved and the battles that they're fighting are won. Why? Because Christians are praying. God loves you. When your kid comes up to you and asks for something, you do your very best to give them anything they ask for that's good for them and that you can afford, right? The prayer of a righteous man. Well, how do I get that righteousness? That's easy. I surrender to Jesus. Have you surrendered to Jesus? Is Jesus in control of your life? Then you, you aren't that unrighteous man that you look at from behind. You're that righteous man that stands here in the now and that's looking forward to the things that God has for you. Romans 8, 26 and 27 says, In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness because we do not know what to pray. Excuse me. We do not know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings. And he searches our hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. What's that saying? Well, the Holy Spirit's going to help us when we pray. That's what it's saying. Because there's one thing that that prayer has to be. We have to pray according to God's will. So in order to pray according to God's will, we need to know what God's will is, right? Yes. So the Holy Spirit helps us because the Holy Spirit is God, he knows what God's will is and he helps us to ask for the things that are according to God's plan for us. So it's important that we not only speak, but we listen to God through the Holy Spirit. So I have to know his will. And that comes from a dialogue, not a monologue listening and speaking. See, when I pray, I need to spend time listening 
to God's response. God will most likely have a response to your prayers. But we've not ever been taught that we need to listen. And we do. We need to listen. John 10, 4 and 5 says, When he has brought all of his own outside, he goes ahead of them, talking about the shepherd. And Jesus says that he's a good shepherd. The sheep follow him. Why? Because they know his voice. See, sheep don't see very well. We're compared to sheep a lot in the New Testament. Sheep depend upon their hearing. And they hear their shepherd. They know his voice. And they follow him. What does that say about us? We need to know the voice of our shepherd. We need to follow him. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't know the voice of a stranger. Too often, we follow the voice of a stranger. We recognize the voice of the stranger better than we recognize the voice of our shepherd. That needs to change. If that's you, that needs to change. We need to be able to recognize the voice of our shepherd so that we can follow him. John 10, 27, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. He knows you. The guy who created everything knows you. And he simply expects that you will follow him. And it makes sense. That's why I came to Jesus. I wanted him to correct all the stuff that I was doing wrong in my life. How about you? Is that is that why you came to Jesus? It's why I came to Jesus. And it's worked out pretty well so far. Psalm 37 4 and 5, a lot of times we just uh, quote verse 4 because we like that part. But it's connected to verse 5. It says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. If you leave it there, it's, it's like, Oh, I'm happy about God. Yay, God. Yay, God. Now give me what I want. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. He gives us some parameters in verse 5. Commit your way to the Lord, trust him, and he will act. See, what, the delighting in the Lord that I do, I love him so much that I commit my ways to him. I let him be the ruler of my life. He's, you know, and, and oftentimes we, since we live in America, we think of our leaders as president, vice president, governor, lieutenant governor, mayor, all that kind of stuff. And the problem with that is Jesus isn't our president because presidents can be voted out, right? They're voted in, they can be voted out. He, God's not trying to depend on your vote. Oh, I don't like what God's doing now, so... I'm going to vote God out of office next, next time we get to vote. That doesn't work that way. God is king. And a king is king for life. And fortunately for us, God will live forever. And he has all authority to do whatever he wants to do. And the nice thing is, when we commit our ways to him, when we trust him, he's going to act on the things that we ask him. Sometimes he's going to say yes, because he wants to give us good things. Did you know that God wants to give you good things? He does. But sometimes we ask for things that God looks at and says, no, that, that, that's going to hurt you. Or no, that's going to hurt somebody else. He's going to say, no, I don't think, I don't think I'm going to give you that, but I'll give you this instead. 
and the instead is always much better than what we asked for in the first place. You ever had that happen in your life? You're asking God for one thing, and it turns out God wanted another thing in your life, but since you're praying about it, gave him permission to get in there. And he gives you something better. I've had that happen several times. Have you had that happen? Mm -hmm. So I need to commit my way to him. I have to be committed to doing things God's way and not my way. And then the last thing I want to talk about prayer is we need to be persistent. See, these Israelites had been praying. Do you think they just started after Moses had a kid? No. They'd been praying the whole 40 years that he'd been gone, probably even before that. Because their labor, their forced labor was terrible. They were enslaved in Egypt. And God heard their prayers. Because they were persistent in their prayers. See, once I find out what God's will is, and these people had, apparently, I must be persistent in prayer. See, prayer is the vital communications with headquarters, and I need to keep that communications up. Even if the answer is a long time coming. How many of you have prayed for things and it took a long time for God to fulfill his promise to you? I've, I've had God promise me things that took a long time for him to answer my prayer. But he answered it. And sometimes we say God didn't answer when he gave us an answer. The answer might be no. But until we get an answer, we need to keep on praying. It says in Matthew 7, 7 through 11, I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation. We read this, uh, I think, a couple of services ago. Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. When a lot of it, a lot of translations just say ask. But when you look in the Greek, the word for ask is a continuing tense, which means it's perpetual. It, it continues on and on and on and on. Have perpetual prayer. And you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be open. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Not good ones. Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So, if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? See, God wants to give you good things. God wants to give me good things. The only time God's going to refrain from giving us the things that we ask for is if we ask for stuff that He deems is bad for us or bad for someone else. So you who say, well, you know, I asked God to let me win the lottery and he never, he never uh, lets me win the lottery. So what, what does that mean? I think that probably means that the lottery would corrupt you like money has corrupted so many people in this world. Does that make sense? Yes. I've never won the lottery either. I mean, one time, uh, you know, somebody gave me a scratch off as a part of either Christmas or birthday. I can't remember. And, uh, I scratched off and I won $5. So I can tell people now, I won the lottery. But you know what I did with that $5? I turned around and, and bought five more scratch offs. And I lost all my money. What was God telling me? I don't want you to depend on something like that. I want you to depend on me. Luke 18 verses 1 through 8. 
Now he told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. So why is he telling this parable? This is one of the only parables that is prefaced by why Jesus is telling the parable. And the reason he's telling them the parable is that he's telling them the parable so that they will pray always and not give up. Pray always and not they, they won't give up in their prayers. They'll be persistent, right? This, there are people out there today that would try to teach you that if you pray for something and then you ask again, that's a lack of faith. No, it's not. Jesus says right here that we need to pray always and not give up. So how is praying again for the same thing a lack of faith? I come to God because I know that he's able to take care of this request if it's good for me, if it's good for the people around me. And I don't give up until God gives me an answer. Yes or no. See, no is an answer as well. So the parable. There was a judge in a certain town who didn't fear God or respect people. And a widow in that town kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while, he was unwilling. But later he came to himself, he said to himself, sorry, even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Then the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. See, the unjust judge, you can't think of the unjust judge and think this is how God behaves because it's not. But he says, listen to what the unjust judge says. The unjust guy gives her what she asks for just because He's annoyed. Well, God's not annoyed with you. Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay helping them? I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? On the earth, will he? When when Jesus comes back, is he going to find people of faith on this planet? People of faith are 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 fast fading, at least in this country, and I think pretty much all over the world. Real Christians are a minority, and we need to keep the faith. We need to finish the race. We need to win the prize that God has called us to win. So this guy, not God, is unjust. And this widow comes along and she wants justice. We don't know what the justice is, but she wants something that Jesus says is justice. So it's something that the judge should give her. And he kept denying her case because he was just annoyed with the lady. And he got even more annoyed because she kept coming and kept coming and kept coming back. So he finally gives in and does what is right. Now, does God get annoyed with us and decide he doesn't want to do what is just? No. God wants to give you justice all the time. So Jesus is saying, if this guy who doesn't fear God, who is unjust, he's a corrupt judge, does this, if this corrupt judge will give this woman justice, which is something that a judge should always do, right? Right? If, if, if this corrupt judge will do that, won't God do better than that? And the answer to that question is yes, he's going to grant us justice if we're crying out to him day and night. And that's what the Israelites were doing. They are crying out to God day and night. They are being persistent in their prayer. 
eventually, we'll find out next week, God sends Moses back. Sorry, spoiler alert. Should have said that to begin with. Let's look at one more place. Matthew 15, verses 21 through 28. When Jesus left there, he withdrew to the area of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came and kept crying out. So she didn't just cry out once, over and over again, crying out. Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely tormented by a demon. Jesus did not say a word to her. That seems rude, doesn't it? His disciples approached him and urged him, send her away because she's crying out after us. He replied to the lady, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came, knelt before him and said, Lord, help me. He answered, It isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now that that seems rude, doesn't it? Does that seem kind of rude? But that was the mindset of the day. Gentiles were dogs. We were dogs. You don't show, you don't throw your pearls before swine. You don't give the bread to dogs, all that kind of stuff. Because the, he, he was commenting on, you know, the thinking of the day. And listen to what this lady says. Jesus had just said, it isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Her answer was this. Yes, Lord, she said. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. What a great answer, isn't it? She wasn't taking no for an answer. She knew Jesus was the answer to her problem, and she wasn't taking no for an answer. Do you think at any time Jesus was thinking, I'm not going to heal this girl? No, but he had to go through this whole thing to show the Jews that were watching why he might do this. And he looked at the lady, and Jesus replied to her, Woman, your faith is great. Let it be done for you as you want. And from that moment, her daughter was healed. Demon cast out. She's good to go. No more spitting up green pea soup. No more head going in a circle. I'm not coming out. None of that stuff. Healed in her right mind. See, he said to this woman that she had great faith. Why? Because she refused to give up. Have you ever had that kind of faith when you're praying to God? You know that Jesus is the answer. You know that it's something according to his will. And you keep on praying, and you keep on praying, and you keep on praying. So often we give up because we haven't received what we asked for right when we asked it. See, I need persistence in my prayer. It's an important concept in the New Testament, and yet people have wiped it out. They say, I I don't believe that part of the Bible. Well, I'll tell you what, I believe everything in the Bible, do you? I believe the, the, the Bible from index to maps. I I believe the Bible. I believe what Jesus says. I believe what God says in the Old Testament. I believe what God says through the prophets. I believe what God says through the through the psalmists and the, the poetry books. I believe what God says in the New Testament. I believe the Bible. This lady believed, and she's a Canaanite. She wasn't even someone who proselyted into Judaism. She wasn't someone necessarily that followed the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hopefully, after that, she was. We need, all of us need, to do better in our prayer life. We need to remember 
what prayer is. It's a conversation with God. Are you having that constant conversation with God? I hope you are. Let's not forget in in the process what it's not. It's not my list of demands to God. And let's begin to ask God how we should pray. And then, when we find out how we should pray, let's not give up until we receive an answer from God. See, God wants to do good things in our life. We need to believe that. We need to be be those people, as Hebrews says, who earnestly seek him. And who knows that God wants to reward them. That's how I please God. I please God by earnestly seeking him. Earnestly also speaks to persistent. I persistently seek God, even though I get knocked away. Have you, have you in your seeking God gotten knocked down and you just got back up? As Rocky Balboa says, <laughs> it's not how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you can get back up. And we as believers need to start getting back up. We need to stand up and pray to God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We need to pray to Jesus and ask him for mercy on our nation. God's people need to pray. And we need to know how to pray. We need to find out from God what God wants to do. And we need to pray for that. And we need to not give up. We need to be persistent. We need to keep on praying and keep on praying and keep on praying until we see God's hand at work in our lives. Am I making sense? Yes. We need to pray so that we can win the war. We need to pray so that we can win the war. We started out talking about how we're in a war. We're still in a war. It's not in a, we're not in a war with people. Too many people have decided that we're in a war with people that don't agree with us. That's ridiculous. There will always be people who don't agree with you. We need to figure out how to live comfortably with people who don't agree with us. We need to be at peace with everyone, Paul says. Let's not allow Satan to cut off our communications with our heavenly headquarters. It says in Galatians 6, 9, last scripture for the day. Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Galatians 6, 9 is something I hold on to all the time. We will reap at the proper time. We will have a harvest at the proper time if we refuse to quit. We need to be like that persistent lady who annoyed the judge. God's not going to get annoyed with you. I think the only reason God would get annoyed with you is if you were not persistent. Oh, I don't want to bother God. He's not going to be bothered. That's the corrupt judge that's bothered. That's not God. So let's determine in our lives that we're going to be people of prayer. And we're going to consider that prayer a tactic in the war on our enemy, the devil. Let's have that ongoing conversation. Let's not just have a list of demands. But let's have a dialogue with God. Let's listen to his voice. And then once we hear it, let's never give up. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have good things for us. I thank you that you want to do good things in our lives. You want to bless us. And so often we don't receive those blessings 
because we've given up too quickly in prayer. Lord, it, it, it seems like our world is falling apart. And I don't need to cower back in fear, but I need to stand up knowing that I have the God who created everything. on my side, or rather, I'm on his. I'm on your side, God. And that you could handle anything that the world wants to throw at us. And so, Lord, knowing that, I pray that you'd help each one of us not abandon our conversation with you, not abandon a sense of dialogue with you where we will listen to you and do the things that you tell us to do. And Lord, that you'd help us to never give up. With everybody's heads bowed and their eyes closed, how many of you today would say, you know, there are some things that I've been praying about and the devil has just worn me down. And at some point I just gave up and I am not really trusting the Lord in that area anymore. But I need to get back to trusting God. I need to get back to finding out what his will is for me in that area. And then I, I need to be one of those people who's persistent and continuing to pray until I get an answer. If that's you this, this evening, would you slip up your hand and put it back down? I know that I can't see you, but God can. God, I, I want to be like that persistent widow. I want to be like that lady who would not give up. I want to be like her. Because I know that you love me. I know that you want to do good things for me. Anybody else before we pray? Father, I thank you that you've given us a line of communication with you. And that line of communication is precious. But so often we just abandon it. Because our, our enemy throws things at us and, and, and we think that you're not listening. But Lord, I thank, thank you that you do hear us. You do hear our prayers. Just like you heard the prayers of the Israelites. Just like you heard the prayers of Jesus. Just like you heard the, the prayers of Paul. Just like you heard the prayers of Peter. And on and on and on. Moses. Lord, you hear our prayers. So help us to be those people who will not quickly give up. Help us to be those people who confidently, not arrogantly, but confidently know your will. And we pray that you would put that into play in our lives. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you, and I will see you on Sunday.